my thanks to the organizers of this program, Professor Shubhra Bhattacharji, Supurna Sinha, and Joseph Samuel, uh, for inviting me to speak at this meeting. Uh, with Michael Berry, Joseph Samuel, and Rajaram Nityananda, uh, all in the audience here, I feel a little bit like John the Baptist before the coming of Jesus Christ. As you may recall, John was beheaded for what he said in a talk he gave to King Herod. So I hope I have better luck than that. Uh, one other thing about the tone of this talk, I remember Professor Arthur Whiteman beginning a lecture of his by saying, my aim in this talk is to inform rather than to astonish. So that is exactly my spirit in this talk. I will try to give to those who may be new to the subject some idea of the mathematical properties of geometric phases uh, against the overall background, the structure of quantum mechanics. Now, this is an interactive session, so I believe questions and comments will be useful as we go along. <coughs> so, uh, let me start with a very brief description of the way we describe states of a quantum mechanical system. Suppose you have a system which I denote by script S. We know that the state of a system, of this system may be pure, that is a state of maximum possible information, or it may be a mixed state, an impure state. So throughout this talk, I will consider only pure states. Such states of a quantum system, as you know, are described using vectors in a uh, complex Hilbert space, which I write as script H. So the letters psi, phi, and so on will denote various, unit, various vectors in the Hilbert space. And the dimension of the Hilbert space, it may be finite or it may be infinite, depending on the nature of the system. Dynamical variables, that is physical quantities which could be measured, are represented, as you know, by Hermitian operators acting on this Hilbert space. Now, each normalized vector, psi, in the Hilbert space, determines a corresponding pure state. So it is useful because of the normalization condition to define the unit sphere in the Hilbert space. I denote it by script B. It consists of all vectors in the Hilbert space with norm unity. So this is a subset of the Hilbert space. So we, we have the statement, to each vector psi in the set script B, there is a corresponding pure state of the system. However, this is a many to one mapping because if you take any phase factor, e to the power i alpha, then psi and this phase factor times psi represent the same pure state. So this mapping is many to one, continuously many to one. So to sort of get rid of this redundancy, we define what we call the ray space for the quantum system by taking a quotient. The ray space script R is the unit sphere in Hilbert space quotiented with respect to this group of phases, U1. So ray space points are completely described by density, pure state density matrices. So for each psi unit vector in Hilbert space, you have a corresponding density matrix row, which is just a projection onto psi. So this defines what we mean by the ray space for the system. So you can say that 
each point in the ray space is an equivalence class of unit vectors related to each other by phases. That is, you take a vector psi, keep it fixed, and let the phase e to the power i alpha run over the unit circle, and you get one point in the ray space. Clearly, neither the unit sphere nor the ray space is a linear vector space. In fact, while B is a subset of the Hilbert space, R is not a subset of the Hilbert space. So what is the relationship between these two, between B and R? There is a projection, a mapping from the unit sphere onto the ray space. I denote it by pi. So for any vector psi, unit vector, its image under this projection is the pure state density matrix, rho of psi, in the ray space. So one says in geometrical language that this unit sphere in the Hilbert space is a principal fiber bundle. The base is the ray space, and each fiber has the structure of the group U1. OK, now for any two vectors normalized always in Hilbert space, given psi1 and psi2, the modulus square of the inner product of psi1 with psi2, which can also be written as a trace of the product of the corresponding density matrices, trace of row, and, row of psi1 times row of psi2, this has a physical interpretation as being a transition probability. What does that mean? It means that if the system were to be prepared in the pure state corresponding to the vector psi1, and then a measurement is carried out to see whether the state is the one corresponding to psi2, this is the probability with which you will get the answer yes. So this is the probability that upon measurement, the state originally prepared in psi1 is found to be psi2, okay? All right, so now with this background, basic background, let me come to a famous theorem in quantum mechanics due to Wigner. This was proved by Wigner in the year 1931. And I might mention in passing that uh, over the decades, many people have given new proofs of this theorem of Wigner from various points of view using different kinds of mathematical ideas. The theorem itself is quite appealing, and so I would like to describe it in a little bit of detail. With the quantum mechanical notions I have just introduced, the asymmetry of a quantum system, S, is defined to be a one-to-one onto map, I denote it by script T, a map of the ray space onto itself, preserving the transition probabilities I just defined. That is, preserving the trace of the product of two elements of ray space. So in more detail, you have a mapping T, which is missing here, the ray space onto itself. The state rho 1 is mapped by the symmetry operation, let us say, into rho 1 prime. The rho 2 is mapped by T into rho 2 prime. The condition for T to be a symmetry operation is that the trace of rho 2 prime, rho 1 prime must be equal to the trace of rho 2, rho 1. So this is the definition of a symmetry for a quantum system adopted by Wigner in the proof of his theorem. It preserves transition probabilities in the sense I described earlier. So one can ask the question, can such a symmetry operation be reinterpreted or written at the level of vectors rather than density matrices? And here is how you might go about it. At the vector level, if you are given psi in the Hilbert space, 
its state is rho of psi, corresponding state is rho of psi, the symmetry operation maps it into rho of psi prime for some other unit vector psi prime, but obviously psi prime is not completely determined. It, it is determined only up to a phase factor. So this definition of a map of ray space onto itself, written in terms of vectors, reads like this. Start with a definite psi, then you get psi prime up to a phase. So in more detail, start with a vector in the Hilbert space. By the projection operation, you get the pure state rho of psi in ray space. Apply the symmetry operation. You get T acting on rho of psi. This is rho of psi prime for some psi prime in Hilbert space known up to a phase. So that freedom will, will be there. That cannot be. Uh, beg your pardon? No. As I said in the beginning, everything is for pure states. So now, the, what does the theorem say? I hope the definition of a symmetry operation is clear. It has to preserve those transition probabilities. That is the only condition. So now, what does the Wigner theorem say? The theorem says, Every such symmetry can be lifted from acting on ray space or density matrices to action on vectors, on vectors in the, on the, within the unit sphere script B, and then by extension to the full Hilbert space. It can always be lifted to an action on vectors that is, the symmetry acting on the pure state rho of psi can be written as the rho of an operator u acting on the vector itself. So this is the vector level description of the symmetry. And there, this can always be done. And when it is done, there are two options. Either you will have u, a linear and unitary operator, defined on the full Hilbert space, which means it preserves the complex inner products among vectors. U of psi 1 inner product U of psi 2 equals psi 1 with psi 2. That is one possibility. The other possibility is that U is anti-linear, anti-unitary. What does that mean? This inner product is a complex conjugate of what appears in the first line. It is psi 1 on the left, psi 2 on the right. So this is the theorem proved by Wigner in uh, 1931. And I think the proof is in his famous book, Group Theory and Atomic Spectra, a very famous book of Wigner. Okay. That was probably the second book bringing out the importance of group representations and group theory in quantum mechanics. The first was by Hermann Weil, the theory of groups and quantum mechanics. Uh, Wigner's was the very next one. Okay, so the theorem says every symmetry defined as a ray space mapping which preserves transition probabilities can always be rewritten as the result of a mapping acting on vectors, which is conceptually and mathematically much simpler, but there will be there are two options for any given symmetry. It may be of the, no, the familiar unitary type, or it may be of the anti-unitary type. And as everybody knows from a study of quantum mechanics, the anti-unitary option in practice is realized only for time reversal transformation, not for any other symmetry. So this is the theorem of Wigner, and I have gone into it in some detail because I feel students should be aware of this theorem and what it says, uh, leave aside going through the proof. That involves a little bit of work, which I will not show here. Now, many years later, as I said, over the years in the 30s, 40s, 50s, many, many uh, mathematically oriented physicists constructed different proofs of this Wigner theorem. In 1964, uh, Wigner's 
collaborator and close friend, Valentine Bargman at Princeton, wrote a remarkable paper in the Journal of Mathematical Physics in which he showed that this choice between the unitary and the anti-unitary possibilities for a given symmetry, which one occurs can be determined immediately with no work at all. This is a remarkable result, and so I want to describe it uh, to you in some detail. The point is that Barman showed by a very simple argument that this option for a given symmetry T can be instantly determined without going through the work of constructing the operation U acting on vectors. In advance of the construction of U, you will, know in, you will already know whether it is going to be unitary or it is going to be anti-unitary. I want you to uh, grasp this beauty of the Bargman result. How did he show this? Of course, his paper gives a proof, his own proof of the Wigner theorem itself. But in the process, he introduces something called the Bargman invariant, which we have found is a very useful and important ingredient to understand the geometric phase as a whole. So here is how the Bergman invariant is defined. Take any three unit vectors, psi1, psi2, and psi3. And we assume no two of them are mutually orthogonal. And you now construct the product of the three Hilbert space inner products, psi1 with psi2, psi2 with psi3, psi3 with psi1. Okay. Now you can see that even though this uh, definition of Bargman begins by using vectors in Hilbert space, unit vectors, it is immediately expressible in terms of density matrices. It is a trace of the product of row one, row two, and row three. So it is a race space quantity, though it is written in terms of vectors to begin with. And it turns out, this is something you can easily check, if the dimension of the Hilbert space is at least two, two, three, four, infinity, in general, this Bergman invariant is a complex quantity. It has a magnitude and it has a phase. And here is the Bergman recipe. He says, to determine instantly whether a given symmetry is of the unitary type or the anti-unitary type, he says, take the expression delta three of psi one, psi two, psi three. It is expressible in terms of the density matrices. So the action of the symmetry on this expression is immediately calculable because you just apply script T to row one, row two, and row three. And you know in advance that only one of two things can happen. This expression delta three remains unchanged. If so, the, un the operator u is going to be linear and unitary, you know it in advance of construction of u. On the other hand, it may happen for a certain symmetry that delta three goes into its complex conjugate. And this is the important part for dimension Hilbert space, at least two, this is in general a complex quantity. So if the Bergman invariant is carried by the symmetry operation into its complex conjugate, you know already it is the antilinear, anti-unitary option which is realized in such a case. Okay. So this is, uh, uh, and then of course, based on the properties of this delta three, uh, Bergman gives in his paper uh, what he calls, I think, a very economical proof of the original Wigner theorem. He, he says that his proof involves arguments at each stage making use of at most three vectors, sets of three chosen in very clever ways. So I 
uh, urge those of you students who are new to these ideas to please read this Bergman paper, 1964. Okay. Now I come to Pancharatnam's remarkable work of 1956, and I believe uh, Professor Rajaram Nityananda will go into it in some detail. I will just pick out a few ideas from Pancharatnam's work. This deals with the pure polarization states of classical plane electromagnetic waves. You are given a frequency omega, and you are also given a fixed propagation direction. So for example, if k is along the z-axis in, in three dimensions, uh, these are pure polarization, polarization states of plane electromagnetic waves propagating along the z direction from negative z towards positive z. In such a case, the only thing that can vary from one such plane wave to another is its polarization state. And the field itself for propagation vector in this form, it has to be transverse. The electric field, I describe it in complex form. Since k dot e is 0, the electric field is a two-component column vector Ex and Ey, the components along the x and the y directions, uh, with each of these, in general, a complex quantity. So we can use, in this simplest non-trivial case, we can use the quantum mechanical notation, though it is a classical optical situation, the physical situation that is being described, and one can see. We are dealing with the case where the dimension of the Hilbert space is two, complex dimension is two, two complex quantities. Therefore, the unit sphere in that Hilbert space is the sphere S3, real S3 in uh, Euclidean four dimensions. And the ray space for this situation, the quotient of B by phase factors U1, is the no, well-known Poincare sphere of classical polarization optics. So R, in this case, is the Poincare sphere, which is S2, two-dimensional sphere in three dimensions. How does the projection map pi work in this case? It is quite simple. I go through it step by step. You start with a complex two-component electric field column vector. It's an element of the Hilbert space H. You normalize it by dividing E by the norm of E. So that is a two-component unit vector in the uh, unit sphere script B. The projection carries this unit electric field vector into E dagger sigma, the three Pauli matrices, times E, divided by mag norm of E squared. That is a real three-dimensional vector of unit length. And that is a point on the Poincare sphere, S2. Of course, this is a definition. The norm squared of E is E dagger E. Okay. I just mentioned in passing, the sigmas that I use are the familiar sigmas of quantum mechanics, the description used, uh, the quantities used to describe spin of spin half particles. In classical polarization optics, the conventions are slightly different from quantum mechanical conventions. The first matrix of classical polarization optics is, I think, sigma 3, and then sigma 1, and then sigma 2. So, for description of spin, we use this Pauli matrices in a certain sequence, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. The classical polarization optics convention is a cyclic permutation of that. So this is how the projection map acts from the electric field vector, complex two component E, to a three-dimensional real unit vector on the Poincare sphere. 
Now, based on physical reasoning, which will become clear, I am sure, from Professor Nityananda's talk later, Pancharatnam introduced the following idea. He said, this is an idea at the level of the Hilbert space. He said, two electric field vectors, each of them a complex two-component vector, will be said to be in phase with one another if E1 dagger E2, which in general is some complex number, happens to be real and greater than zero. So it has no phase and the modulus is uh, positive. So this is the definition of a Pancharatnam, the concept of two electric field vectors, two Hilbert space vectors, let us say, being in phase with one another. He then found that this concept of being in phase with one another is not a transitive concept. And this is his great discovery, a very profound result. In words, suppose E1 and E2 are two electric field vectors with E1 dagger E2 real positive. So they are in phase with respect to one another. Similarly, suppose E2 and E3 are in phase with one another. E2 dagger E3 is real positive. He showed the consequence of his work was to see that these in-phase relationships do not imply in general that E1 and E3 are in phase with respect to one another. Even though this may be real positive and this may be real positive, in general, E3 dagger E1 will have a phase and it will not be a real positive quantity. This was Pancharatnam's remarkable discovery. Moreover, so I hope the result is clear from this. And he showed, he gave a quantitative measure of the non-transitivity of this notion. The result is as follows. Supposing the three vectors, electric field vectors E1, E2, and E3, map to points N1, N2, N3 on the Poincare sphere. Then he showed that assuming E1 dagger, E1 and E2 are in phase, E2 and E3 are in phase, the third inner product, E3 dagger E1, has in general a non-zero phase, and it is minus one half of a solid angle on the Poincare sphere, the solid angle corresponding to a spherical triangle with vertices N1, N2, and N3, the results of the projection pi acting on the electric fields, and the vertices being joined one to the next, one, N1 to N2, 2 to 3, and 3 to 1 by great circle arcs on the Poincare sphere, namely geodesics on S2. Okay. Now, I think you can see a surprising and beautiful and instant connection between the Pancharatnam ideas of 1956 and the Bargman work of 1964. They were eight years apart, and I, Bargman obviously did not know of Pancharatnam's work. But the connection is now immediate in this two-dimensional case, uh, case. The very fact that there is such a thing as a Bargman invariant, which is in general complex, tells you that the Pancharatnam concept cannot be transitive. It tells you, before you do have to do any work, that E3 dagger, if the Bargman invariant of E1, E2, E3 happens to be complex, it's a product of three factors. If the first one is real positive and the second is real positive, it is a third factor which has to carry the phase of the whole Bargman invariant. So this is why I feel it is a very important thing to 
bring together, bring close together the ideas of Bargman on the one hand and of Pancharatnam, earlier ideas of Pancharatnam on the other, and show calculations can be done later, but the result can be grasped immediately. The, I repeat, the very existence of the Bargman invariant, delta 3 for E1, E2, E3, implies instantly the non-transitivity of the Pancharatnam in-phase idea. The actual calculation by Pancharatnam that it is a half of a solid angle, uh, that is a result of more detailed calculation, which I do not have to go into. Okay. Well, I must say something here, uh, which Rajaram may not wish to say in his talk. So you must let me say it on your behalf. I believe that uh, Berry's work, to which I will turn in a moment, was being described in a seminar in Raman Institute in the 1980s. And Professor Ramaseshan, Raja Ramnityananda's guide and advisor, was in the audience. And so was Raja Ram. And uh, Professor Ramaseshan, when he heard the description of Berry's work, realized that there was something in Pancharatnam's work which is related to it. And he got Raja Ram Nityananda to explore that. And what's the relationship? Ram, Rama Seshan was Pancharatnam's elder brother. By how many years? 10 years or many years difference. And uh, so it was to the eternal credit of Rama Seshan and Nityananda that this connection was brought out. Okay. I just say that in passing. Now I come to the very adiabatic geometric phase and its generalizations. The original Berry discovery was based on very appealing and strong physical motivations. The use of the Schrodinger equation of quantum mechanics in the adiabatic approximation and imposition of the condition of cyclic evolution. It's pure state evolution described by the Schrodinger equation with some Hamiltonian in some Hilbert space. And you assume that the physical state begins at some, begins somewhere at, let us say, initial time t equal to zero. And after a certain amount of time, at later time capital T, the physical state returns to what it was at t equal to zero. This is the imposition of the condition of cyclic evolution. It was then shown that a new phase of a geometric nature appears explicitly in the solution to the Schrodinger equation. I must say I feel a little bit peculiar saying all this to you with the discoverer here in the audience. Okay. Now, this beautiful result of uh, Berry was soon generalized in two stages. The geometric phase can be identified under more general conditions. I repeat that what Berry assumed was the adiabatic approximation of quantum mechanics and the idea of cyclic evolution. Well, very soon, 1986, I think, Aharonov and Anandan showed that the adiabatic condition can be dropped, even for non-adiabatic but cyclic evolution described by the Schrodinger equation a geometric phase can be displayed. The second generalization in 1987, Sam? 1987, something like so long ago. Samuel and Bandari, working at the Raman Research Institute, removed the cyclic condition, cyclic evolution condition. So I repeat, Aharonov and Anandan showed first there is no need for adiabatic hypothesis. Samuel and Bhandari showed 
a year or so later, there is no need for the cyclic condition. Even without these two assumptions which were present in the original work by Berry, the geometric phase can always be displayed. Can, it always exists. Okay. Last week, somebody at the conference at Raman Institute said to me, we see Samuel so often, but we have never seen Bhandari. And we thought that Samuel is Bhandari's first name. <laughs> I to tell them, no, he lives in uh, Bangalore, right, in Sadashiv Nagar. He has retired from the Raman Institute. And they are two distinguishable people. <laughs> so these are two beautiful extensions of the original result uh, from Aharanov and Anandan, and then Samuel and Bhandari. So let me tell you a little bit. So the re net result is this. You take any Hamiltonian, you take a, any solution of the Schrodinger equation from one initial time to another final time, any choices of initial and final times. That is, you take any solution of the Schrodinger time-dependent equation over any interval of time, whatever the Hamiltonian may be, with that solution for a finite stretch of time, you can associate a corresponding geometric phase, or you can extract such a phase. Okay. Now, from this point onwards, I will concentrate on the mathematical properties of the geometric phase understood in this way. That is, understood in the framework given by Aharonov and Anandan, and then by Samuel and Bhandari. Any Schrodinger equation, any Hamiltonian, any stretch of time, the solution of the Schrodinger equation has associated with it a geometric phase. So this is the sense in which I will speak of geometric phase from now on. So just a little bit of uh, information about dimensions. Suppose the system, quantum system, was of dimension capital N. Then we know that the corresponding Hilbert space has a complex dimension, n. The unit sphere in Hilbert space has a real dimension, 2n minus 1, which is always odd. In the case of the Pancharatnam polarization optics example, this n was 2, so dimension here was 3. The ray space has real dimension, 2 times n minus 1, which is always an even number. In the case of optics, R is the Poincare sphere S2. In mathematical terminology, it is a complex projective space Cp n minus 1. I will not be using this any further. But the important thing from the mathematical point of view is this. Ah, by the way, in case the system S has, in case the Hilbert space has infinite dimension, we continue to use these notions, the unit sphere and the ray space, but there is a, a little bit of formal nature uh, associated with these ideas. What is important is the following. Notice the ray space always has even real dimension. It is a fact that the ray spaces for pure states of quantum mechanical systems are very special mathematical objects. They happen to be Riemannian manifolds, like the ones that one learns of in the mathematical framework of general relativity, for example. But they are also, at the same time, what are called symplectic manifolds. So the ray spaces are really rather special mathematical spaces. This symplectic manifold property means that the ray space is like the phase space that we use in uh, Hamiltonian classical mechanics, phase space with Poisson brackets and so on. But it is not of the form 
that arises from a well-defined configuration space. There is no physically well-defined n minus one dimensional configuration space, which is what we deal with in Lagrangian mechanics, from where we go on to Hamilton, Hamiltonian phase space. These are phase spaces in the sense that they have the Poisson bracket structure or the symplectic structure built in. Now let me tell you very briefly uh, the strategy of um, Samuel Bhandari for showing that the cyclic condition is not required to define geometric phases. Here is how it goes. I will first describe to you the geodesics that are present in the ray space thanks to its being a Riemannian manifold, namely it has a Riemannian metric associated with it, which has a technical name. So here is how geodesics in the ray space can be described, can be constructed. They are quite easy, quite simple. It is most economical to describe the most general geodesic in ray space by lifting it to the vector description, which is always mathematically easier. Suppose you take two points, row one and row two in the ray space, not orthogonal to each other. That is, trace row one, row two is strictly greater than zero. Suppose you choose a vector psi one projecting onto row one, psi two projecting onto row two. So these are unit vectors in Hilbert space. Choose the relative phases of psi one and psi two so that the inner product has no phase. It is real, positive, so it can be written as cosine theta with theta in this interval, zero, less than theta, less than pi by two. So given two points, row one and row two, pick the points sitting on top of them, psi one and psi two, so that they are in phase in the Pancharatnam sense. Then, and this is just a matter of convenience, then, the geodesic in ray space connecting row one to row two is the projection of a lift of it, of it, which I write as script C. So this is a curve in the Hilbert space, which I will describe in a moment. Its projection is the geodesic you want to go from row one to row two. What is this script G, script C? It is a parametrized set of vectors, psi of s in the unit sphere. The parameter s starts at zero and ends at theta, this theta, and here is psi of s along the way. Psi of s is psi one cosine of the parameter plus psi two minus psi one cos theta sine of the parameter over sine theta. So the parameter goes from zero up to theta. At s equal to zero, this part is absent, and psi of s is the starting point, psi one. At s equal to theta, you will see there is a cancellation of terms, and psi of s at theta is psi two. So this curve links psi one to psi two in a certain way. It's a very simple expression, trigonometrically speaking. Its projection is the geodesic running from row one to row two. Okay, I hope you have seen the, what it looks like. To show that this is the geodesic, you have to solve the geodesic equations and so on. Now, Samuel and Bhandari handled the non-cyclic evolution case in the following very clever way. They said, you, ah, so you use the Schrodinger evolution, Schrodinger equation, whatever the Hamiltonian may be, to go from psi one, let us say psi at S one, to psi two, psi at S two. So the solid line, is a depiction of 
the solution of a Schrodinger equation for some Hamiltonian. There it goes. Having go gone from this initial state to that final state, they say, now let us return from psi at S2 to psi at S1 via the unique geodesic connecting them. The geodesic is of the kind I just described in the previous transparency. So then the, in essence, their idea is the following. Once you have obtained from this non-cyclic case a related cyclic evolution, use the Aharonov Anandan definition for which adiabaticity is not required. So in essence, this is the Samuel and Bhandari treatment of the non-cyclic case. The geometric phase associated with this non-cyclic, non-necessarily adiabatic evolution is the same as the Aharon of Anandan definition for this cyclic case obtained by adding on a geodesic for the return path. So the solid line need not be a geodesic. It is determined by the Hamiltonian and the Schrodinger equation. The return path is the geodesic coming from the ray space being a Riemannian manifold. Okay. So I realize there have been no questions. I think everything is perfectly clear. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So in the case of the sphere, as an example, the multiple, multiple geodesics occur when they are at diametrically opposite points. It, that corresponds to rho 1, rho 2 being orthogonal to each other. So for the assumption made here that trace rho 1, rho 2 is greater than 0, there is a unique shorter geodesic. There will be another one which is longer. So you work with the shorter one. OK. Now I come to the last uh, in this series of developments based on the original work of Berry, what I would call the kinematic approach to the geometric phase. This is entirely in the Hilbert space language, and there is no use of even a Schrodinger equation or a Hamiltonian. So this is the next step after the previous ones. Here are the ingredients. I will introduce this notation. Script C is a continuous once differentiable. I mean, these conditions can be written down in detail. I just indicate them. It's a once differentiable smooth curve in the space of unit vectors in Hilbert space. So it is psi of s for each value of s in some range, you have a unit vector. So this script C is a curve embedded in the unit sphere. Capital C is the result of projection of script C onto the ray space, into the ray space, and it is the family, once differentiable, of pure state density matrices. Rho of S for parameter S is rho of psi of S. And this is a curve which lies in the ray space, and the parameter goes from S1 up to S2. OK. All right. So script C, I repeat, runs from, let us say, some psi 1 to psi 2. And its image goes from the corresponding row 1 to the corresponding row 2. Now, on such systems of curves, script C and capital C, there are two natural groups of transformations which one can think of. The one is making local changes of the phases of vectors along script C. That is, you take a curve in Hilbert space, parametrized with S, psi of S, and at each point along that curve, you change the phase of psi of S in an arbitrary way, preserving the smoothness conditions. So, this is the way in which from one curve C, you produce another curve C prime. Obviously, as you can tell, the projection is unchanged. Capital C 
remains the same under this kind of local phase change. The next transformation you can make are what are called reparameterizations. You can take this parameter S, which labels the points along these curves continuously, and replace it by another parameter S prime, provided it is a monotonically increasing function of S. So take any function F of S, which is differentiable, make sure that it always has a positive first derivative, and S prime is then a new choice of parameter, a reparameterization transformation, which can be used to label the points on the curve. So then you can formally say that this initial curve script C goes to a new curve, C prime, the result of merely changing the values of the parameter along the curve, no change in the points themselves. Sometimes this is said to mean that the trace of C prime, the actual set of vectors in Hilbert space which you are dealing with is unchanged, okay? So you have these two, these two transformations on these ingredients, local changes of phases and changes of parameterization, monotonically increasing change of parameter. So then you can ask, what, are the, what is the simplest expression you can write involving these curves as the argument? What is the simplest functional you can construct which is invariant under both groups of transformations, phase changes and changes of parameter? And here it is. This is the simplest invariant expression. I write it as phi subscript g, g for geometric. This is a functional of a race space curve. It is the difference of two terms, each of which is computed at the level of vectors. So these are functionals of script C. What is phi total C, script C? It is the relative phase in the Pancharatnam sense of the vectors psi of S1 and psi of S2, the initial and final points of the curve script C. So this is the first term. The second term is called phi dynamical. It's also a functional of this curve script C. It is an imaginary part of the integral from initial value of S to the final value ds psi of S d psi of S by ds, inner product in Hilbert space. So it is a fact, as I have indicated in this notation, this total phase and the dynamical phase are individually quantities which are determined by the curve in Hilbert space. But the difference is guaranteed to be a functional on ray space. This is uh, easy to verify. It turns out that this is the geometric phase of Aharanov, Anandan, Samuel, and Bandari for the general non-cyclic situation. I just want you to realize there's no explicit reference to any Hamiltonian or any Schrodinger equation, classical or quantum. There is only the properties of complex Hilbert space and curves in complex Hilbert space combined in this particular way. Yes. No, there isn't. There is no, that also is not there. Yeah, that is correct. Of course, for this total phase to be well defined modulo 2 pi, one has to assume that the initial and final points are not orthogonal to each other. So that's a, you have to leave that out. So this is, I just want to repeat, this is the geometric phase of Aharonov, Anandan, Samuel, and Bandari for general non-cyclic situation. It's a purely kinematic idea. That is the main thing I want to say. So I, I might say in passing that we started with Berry's original 
discovery of his phase in a certain physical situation. Then the conditions assumed by Berry were relaxed in stages, first by Aharonov, Anandan, second by Samuel and Bhandari. But at every stage, if you go back to the earlier assumptions, you recover the earlier results and definitions. So the geometric phase is being defined in more and more general conditions, step by step, but at every stage, you can reverse what you're doing and you will recover the earlier results. This is the way it should be. So I just mention a little bit of differential geometric notation just to give a flavor, not to uh, explain in great detail. This dynamical phase is the integral along the curve in Hilbert space of an object called a one form. It's a differential form of degree one. It is a geometrical object defined on the unit sphere in Hilbert space. And formally, here is its definition. A, the one form, is minus i psi dagger d psi. This is the differential geometric notation. Okay. So this is, uh, A is a one form which is, exists on the unit sphere in, uh, in Hilbert space. Again, a passing comment in uh, Samuel and Bhandari's work, they do not impose the condition that the vectors psi in Hilbert space be normalized. They allow them to be non-normalized. I just feel more comfortable if they are normalized, so I have used that notation. Yeah? On the? No. Psi is a general vector of unit length. It is a general point on the space B. Yeah. For a particular curve, you take a particular family of psi, psi of S. But psi, as a, on its own, it lives all over the unit sphere in Hilbert space. So it is, this A is a one form which is defined on the space B. Okay. All right. Yeah, good question, but that is the meaning. So this geometric object, A, it exists on the, at the Hilbert space level, and I've used normalized vectors. It does not descend in a well-defined way to the ray space. There is nothing on ray space of the nature of A, no important, meaningful one form on the ray space. But what does exist on the ray space, a well-defined geometrical object, is the exterior derivative of A. In differential geometric language, DA is said to be a two form. And uh, what happens? Formally, you can calculate dA starting with the expression for A itself. Remember this expression? You apply D to it, use the rules associated with the uh, use of the symbol D, and then uh, you get this expression, minus I D psi dagger wedge D psi. I have not introduced wedge, but let, us, let it be. You, you can learn about it later. So I want to stress this one form exists on the Hilbert space level, not at the ray space level, but its exterior derivative, analog of curl if you like, is something which descends in a decent way to the ray space. There is something on ray space called omega, a two form, and dA comes out of omega on the ray space by a certain operation called the pullback. Remember, pi is the projection from B to R. Pi star is a rule to go from differential forms on R to differential forms on B. So A does not descend, but dA does in a decent fashion. So omega here is a two form on R. 
It is non-degenerate and it is closed. Its curl is zero. And uh, so it is this omega which exists on R which makes R a symplectic manifold. Okay? So some of these notions are were new to me, they are still new to me, but I just want you to be aware of the properties which ray space has, and if you wish to use them in any context, please uh, study them a little further. So on the one hand, there is a Riemannian metric on the ray space, which is what determines the geodesics which I showed earlier, and which were used so effectively by Samuel and Bandari. On the other hand, it also has a symplectic structure, this non-degenerate and closed two form, which makes it look like the phase spaces of classical mechanics. Okay. So there is a technical name for such spaces. I will not go into it. Um, you can learn about them later. But to know that the ray space of quantum mechanics has these two aspects is itself something very, very surprising and very interesting. Who would have thought that all that we study about vectors and Schrodinger equation, inner products, behind all this, there is this amount of mathematical structure and richness. So I can now say that in the spirit of Samuel and Bhandari, the geometric phase for any non-cyclic curve in the ray space is expressible, apart from the sign, as a two-dimensional area over any surface having C plus the return geodesic as its boundary. S is any two-dimensional surface in the ray space whose boundary is the non-cyclic path C with this geodesic to go from psi 2 to back to psi 1 added on. So you take an open curve, make it closed by this construction involving a geodesic, get a closed curve, choose any two-dimensional surface whose boundary is that, and the geometric phase of Aharonov, Anandan, Samuel Bandari is the symplectic area associated with any such S. The S is arbitrary to a very large extent, only its boundary is determined. So you get this impression, you get this feeling now, in this generalized way, geometric phases are symplectic areas in ray spaces. Just a uh, mnemonic. Yeah. Symplectic area, it is in classical mechanics, there is it is what is called the second Poincare integral invariant. It is a, like a two-dimensional area, but it is very different from Euclidean concept of area. You can have a non-trivial two-dimensional surface. In the Euclidean case, a non-trivial surface has a non-zero area, two-dimensional. In symplectic geometry, it is a antithesis of Euclidean geometry. In symplectic geometry, there is no such concept as the length of a vector. There is no such thing as the angle between two vectors, it's like, a, like a cosine theta. But uh, symplectic geometry is at the heart of the Poisson bracket idea in classical mechanics. So it's very, very important. And uh, uh, since you have asked this question and you are from Mohali, uh, Arvind and a few of us wrote a useful short review paper in Pramana when Rajaram Nityananda was the chief editor. <laughs> so it's a very small group doing all these things with one another. Uh, that was 1997, I think. Uh, it was a review of the use of symplectic groups in optics, classical optics and quantum mechanics. Uh, experience has shown that many people have found that review very useful. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Even now, people use it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is 
what we are led to, symplectic geometric phases are symplectic area, geometric phases in the sense I am talking about, Aharana, Anand, and SB are two dimensional symplectic areas in ray spaces. So to repeat what I just said, the surface S may be non-trivial, really in the geometric sense, a two dimensional set of points, but this integral can very well be zero. Okay. It is, area in this sense is not intrinsically positive. That's the main thing. Okay. <clears throat> now I want to show you a nice generalization. First, what is the general connection between Bargmann invariance, which I began this lecture with, and geometric phases? I want to show you the connection between them and then show you how to generalize it. This connection between the two is a very easy consequence of the kinematic method I have described earlier. For any quantum mechanical system, S, with a Hilbert space and etc., choose three mutually non-orthogonal points. Choose psi1, psi2, psi3 in the unit sphere, and under projection, let them go into points rho1, 2, and 3 in the ray space. Then you find the argument of the Bargmann invariant for psi1, psi2, and psi3 is the negative of the geometric phase for a certain closed curve in ray space. It is the union of the geodesic from rho1 to rho2 and the geodesic rho2 to rho3 and the geodesic rho3 to rho1 with a minus sign. So this is the connection but in general at this stage between Bargmann invariance and geometric phases. All right? The arg arguments of Bargmann invariance are geometric phases for associated closed curves in ray space. I want to emphasize the left hand side is determined by the choice of the vertices, psi1, psi2, and psi3. You do not have to connect psi1 to psi2 in any way, or 2 to 3, or 3 to 1. But to interpret this phase of the left of delta 3 as a geometric phase, you must connect psi1 to psi2 with a geodesic, which I have described already, 2 to 3 with another geodesic, and 3 back to 1, the third geodesic. And then you can use this differential geometric machinery and say the argument of a Bargmann invariant is a symplectic area. Choose any two-dimensional S whose boundary is this string of geodesics one after the other. So the boundary of the surface S is C12, the first geodesic, union 23, union geodesic 31. This is easily generalized for any number of uh, vectors in the Bargmann expression, the nth order uh, Bargmann invariant, I don't have to go into it. And it's a simple fact which comes out of all this. The, geo the geometric phase for any geodesic in ray space is always zero. This is very easy from all these definitions. And remember now, here I'm using it in the Samuel Bhandari sense, in general, uh, always a geodesic, a non-trivial geodesic in the ray space is an open curve. Okay? It starts somewhere and ends up somewhere else. But we know from their work, there is an associated geometric phase, and that is always zero for geodesics. Okay. Now comes, now it turns out, that this, this connection, this fact, this connection between Bargmann invariants and geometric phases, well, initially you may, you may think that this is a very beautiful, it is a beautiful result. You may think it's a result which connects the Riemannian metric properties of ray space 
with the symplectic manifold properties of the ray space. This integral here is a symplectic area. It comes from the symplectic properties of R. The left-hand side involves geodesics. Geodesics come from the Riemannian properties of R. So we'll say, aha, the theory of the geometric phase, it is so rich that it connects these two aspects of the ray space R. But guess what? This is just a chance, it's just a fluke. Because there are curves which I will, we have called null phase curves. I'll define them in a moment. These are the most general curves in quantum mechanical ray spaces for which the geometric phase in the generalized sense is always zero. Here is the definition of a null phase curve. It is a curve in the ray space of a quantum system labeled in some way by a parameter running from S1 to S2. The point at value S is rho of some psi of S so here is a string of vectors continuously varying in Hilbert space projected to ray space and this is a curve. When is this to be called a null phase curve? Here is our definition. Such a curve is an NPC if for all choices independently of parameters S, S prime and S double prime along this curve the third order Bergman invariant is real and greater than zero. It never has a phase, okay? So this is the definition of a null phase curve in the most general case. It is a curve in ray space all along which delta three never shows up a complex nature. It is real positive at every, for all choices, uh, for all choices of three vectors along the curve. It's very easy to show that if you are given a null phase curve, it can be lifted in a special way to the vectors level, vector level. These are what we will, you should call global Pancharatnam lifts. Any null phase curve has a lifts to the vector level such that in the, along the lifted curve, any two vectors are in phase in the Pancharatnam sense. So that's the definition of a null phase curve. Here it is defined in terms of the Bergman invariant. Here is its very nice property. Every null phase curve can always be lifted to the vector space level, Hilbert space level, such that any two points along it are in phase in the uh, Pancharatnam sense. So you can see how interwoven these different concepts are. Each concept comes up more than once uh, in one context or another. Now, it turns out, I'm almost done. If you are dealing with a two-dimensional Hilbert space, which is what Pancharatnam was dealing with for uh, classical polarization optics, and it is also what you will deal with in the quantum mechanical case if you are dealing with spin half system and its quantum mechanics. If the Hilbert space is of dimension two, so that the ray space is a Poincare sphere, these null phase curves are nothing but geodesics, great circle arcs on the sphere S2. Nothing new for dimension two. But for dimension three or more, geodesics are null phase curves, but the null phase curves are far more numerous. So immeasurably more, what they, more of them. That is to say, if I give you two points in ray space, row one and row two, and the dimension of Hilbert space is three or more, not only can you draw the geodesic from row one to row two, as Samuel and Bandari did, that will be a null phase curve but you can draw infinitely more null phase curves connecting row one to row two. So null phase curves are a vast generalization of the idea of Riemannian metric geodesics, but they exist only for dimension three or more. For dimension two, they are the same as geodesics. And now is the final statement. The most general way in which you can connect Bergman invariants and geometric phases is what I have written in this equation. 
The argument of Bergman's delta 3 of psi 1, psi 2, psi 3 is all, you know, in general, the left hand side is complex, so it has a phase. That phase is apart from the minus sign, the geometric phase of a three sided figure in ray space. Psi 1 is connected to psi 2 by any null phase curve you wish. It could be the geodesic, but it doesn't have to be. Psi 2 is connected to psi 3 by any null phase curve. And finally, psi 3 to psi 1, or rho 3 to rho 1 by a third null phase curve. I've written this here. So for dimension h greater than or equal to 3, this is a vast generalization of the earlier connection between Bergman invariants and geometric phases. So I've indicated it in this figure. It didn't come out too well. Here are three points in the ray space, rho 1, rho 2, and rho 3. These, these have turned out to be straight lines. They should not have been straight lines. They are the unique geodesics from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 1. And what is earlier known is that the geometric phase for this closed curve is the phase of the Bergman invariant delta 3. But now we find you can replace these three geodesics by any null phase curves. One, two, n12 here, n23 here, n31 here. And I want to repeat, if dimension of Hilbert space is three or more, there is an uncountable number of null phase curves connecting rho 1 to rho 2. Similarly, rho 2 to rho 3. For all of these wavy sided closed loops, the geometric phase is the same. So the argument of delta 3 psi 1 psi 2 psi 3 stays the same. So you can say that the Bergman Invariant has a phase which is invariant under, with respect to the choices of these null phase curves. And this is the most general way in which the two ideas can be combined. So it, I hope you see from this that it is a chance coincidence that in two dimensions, geodesics and null phase curves are the same. But the true role is played by the null phase curves for geometric phase uh, results. And it is what comes out of the symplectic manifold structure of the ray space. So in this gen most general connection, the fact that the ray space has a Riemannian structure does not play an important role. This is what I want to emphasize. So I stop here. I have tried to bring out the mathematical properties of geometric phases in the most general situation. Uh, a particularly interesting class of such phases arises when you have, in, as in quantum mechanics, unitary representations of uh, Lie groups, whether they are compact or non-compact. In those cases, uh, so that uh, you have Hilbert space unitary representations of well-defined Lie groups, then a lot of the machinery of Lie algebras, representation theory can all be brought in and you can uh, study the properties of geometric phases in some greater detail. So my concluding sentence is, in the overall framework of quantum mechanics, the ideas of Wigner, Pancharatnam, and Bergman in that sequence chronologically are all very deep and very beautiful. But their interconnections have become clear only thanks to Berry's profound discovery and its equally beautiful generalizations by the famous quartet, Aronoff, Anandan, Samuel, and Bandari. So at the end of this, you find it is a Bergman invariant that turns out to be the key concept. Out of this concept, the entire theory of geometric phases formally can be built up. And I am very fortunate that I had a few occasions to meet and talk with Bergman in the year 1964-65. That was the year that he wrote his paper. And I learned many things from him. 
But when I asked him, Professor Bargman, what are differential forms? Because I had <laughs> tried to study, learn them. And he said, oh, they are just anti-symmetric covariant tensor fields. That's all he said to me. That was his geometric general relativity uh, intuition that was speaking. So thank you very much for giving me this chance to present this talk. <laughs>